Jordan. Uh, just one or two more announcements. So uh, Margaret is hosting on October 31st a harvest party at her house. There are flyers here. At the bottom of the flyer, there's RSVP uh, for food purposes. So if you're planning on coming, um, just let her know so we know how much to buy, to prepare, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and there's um, donation treat bags as well. So just talk to Margaret. You guys, I'm sure, by now know who she is. If you have any questions, call her, talk to her. Um, she is here today. Um, she'll be glad to answer those questions for you. Um, as you know, men's discipleship group and women's discipleship group meet tomorrow. If you're new or haven't come yet, please join us. You just jump right in where we're at. You'll feel at home. You're not going to be like, did I miss anything? No, we'll get you caught up, get you up to speed, and start teaching you, if you haven't already, how to study your Bibles. So then you can effectively become just a stronger, better disciple and soon be teaching it. Again, don't be overwhelmed. I think that just... It's a challenge to our generation where just it's the pastor's job who does all the teaching. <laughs> no, it's not. So let me help you. That's what I've been doing. I was at, I forget where we were. Emily and I stopped somewhere before we went up to see uh, the dog breeder. And we just stopped in a Wawa. Someone said, hey, I like your shirt. Started talking. And it's the same thing I keep hearing from every Christian that I talk to outside of these walls. Hey, how long you been saved? How long you been really on fire walking with the Lord? Twelve years. Awesome. If I open to Philippians chapter 3, can you teach a couple of verses? Uh, no way. We need to end this epidemic. So I'm on that mission. As you know, you hear me see it, say it every week. We have to study our Bibles. You have to study your Bibles. So hopefully you can take one person. I don't care if you're a teenager. Teenagers, you know teenagers. You can disciple a teenager. Adults, you can do adults. Men with the men, women with the women. Husbands, discipling your wives and your children. Very, very important. If you think it's just about Sunday mornings, that's one day. This is something that I know the Lord wants in our lives every day. And you've probably heard me use this illustration before, but if you like to work out, you're a gym buff guy, and you miss one day, <laughs> I know for me, the next day, it gets harder to go back. Not only that, but I'm weaker. Like, I have to maintain such a discipline to keep just the little strength that I have. You need to be disciplined with this too. Stop giving in to the, I can't make it, I can't do it. That's the flesh just having so much control. Don't you want to be strong for the Lord? Don't you want to say, man... I ran the course. I finished the race. I know I do. So please, hear my heart. Because otherwise, this Sunday morning will become like everyone else's Sunday mornings if all you do is six days a week is nothing else. And you'll end up in that same boat of, well, I've been a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years and still can't really understand it and I can't even teach it on a very basic level. I can tell you that is not what God wants for your life. And I know some of you may be like, I don't care, I'm not coming. And hey, that's between you and the Lord. My job is to offer you the opportunity to do so. But it's between you and the Lord to say, I'm, I really want to do this, God. I love you. After all, He only saved us from our sins, right? We are in 2 Corinthians. If you'll turn there. Oh my goodness. 
So I have to have everyone turn around for a second and look at the cheese head that's sitting uh, behind me. <laughs> for those of you who don't understand, he's a Green Bay Packers fan. Don't worry, t today's message is about comfort. You're going to need it. <laughs> oh, I love her. I love her family. I needed serious comfort about, I don't know, 11 o'clock Thursday night as the Eagles game was winding down. I was getting death threats from my wife for being too loud. In case you didn't watch the game, it was a nail biter. I'm calling the NFL the National Fixed League. I really believe things are fixed. I know this has nothing to do with this. Some of you may be mad because it's football and you, I get it, but... Really? 12 penalties or something? 100, like 30 yards? The other team? One penalty, one yard? Just saying. Anyway, we are at 2 Corinthians. We are starting the second letter. We finished 1 Corinthians last week. Hey, go back. If there's anything I taught on that you missed and you want to just go over, we have a website. All the messages are there. Go back and listen. Go back and restudy. Go back and relearn. If there was something that I taught that you were a little unsure of, that's why we have that there. And then you can share it with whomever you want. But uh, we are going to start making our way through 2 Corinthians. I have three other quick starting stopping points. If you'll pin mark them in your Bibles. First is Lamentations, chapter 3. And if you just want to take notes and write the verses down, I get that. You can do that. Lamentations chapter 3 was 1. Matthew chapter 14. And I'll give you the verses when we get there. So we have Lamentations chapter 3, Matthew chapter 14, and James chapter 5. Let's go to God. And boy, let's ask him to bless this time, shall we? Lord, again, we come before you to give you thanks for this day and all the blessings of it. Lord, in this crazy world that we live in, that is unraveling, Lord, fast. Evil abounds. Chaos is ensuing. There is just sin everywhere, God. I am so thankful to you that we can know that this is just a temporary living place. We're just passing through like pilgrims, God. And in this world, Jesus, you said that we would have tribulation. There would be hard times, but be of good cheer because you, only you, only Jesus has overcome the world. Lord, what a safety net, safety blanket that is for us. What a promise that is. And we lay hold of it this morning by faith. And we ask that your word would be lifted high this morning. That everyone would know that you are Lord and Savior. Be glorified, Jesus. Teach us your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians. We're only going to cover the first 11 verses. I've entitled today's message, Continuous Comfort. Continuous Comfort. Just by way of introduction, since we finish 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians doesn't need a real lengthy introduction because we're still dealing with the same church. It's another letter that's written about eight months to a year after 1 Corinthians was written. It falls around a time where Paul, as you know, 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of problems in Corinth. The church, there was a lot of sin. And it makes sense. Sometimes we forget when we go to church, it's a bunch of sinners. 
what better place to go? This is the house of the sick that where we're made healed, we're whole here by the blood of Christ, by the forgiveness He offers. And if you remember, Paul poured out his heart trying to correct the church. The letter ultimately gets delivered. News eventually reaches him at some point. Some of the problems have been fixed and some have not. Some new problems arise. And when you read through 2 Corinthians, it's one of, if not Paul's most personal and passionate letters that he writes. Think about it. And I need you to please, this letter requires you to put yourself in Paul's shoes. Because on one side, it's written from a heart of a pastor, an apostle, someone who spends and labors all of his time trying to help build a church, raise up the church, encourage, love, support a church. That God said, Paul, I want you to go here because I have people, many people that are going to get saved. But what many don't know, if you're not in ministry, let me ask you a question. How many of you in here, the, the, how many of you in here are in full-time ministry? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you in here are a born-again Christian? Raise your hand. Now let me ask you again. How many of you in here are in full-time ministry? Everyone put your hand up right now. This is not just my job. And I don't see it as a job. Do you see by the hands that didn't go up, I already pray there's a level of conviction that you need to see yourself in full-time ministry. Paul can't make it any clearer, and neither can I. If you only see this as a place you come to be ministered to, but have no intending of taking the ministry out then what is it to you? Because I know, and I want God for you to know, you play a very important role, every one of you. And I know that I care deeply about you. I care that you grow. I care that you study. I care that you do the right things. I don't care if you're in junior high or high school, you're really important to me. You have things going on there that you need help and support with. How to be the best disciple in those arenas. You in the workforce. Are you taking Jesus there every single day? Wherever you are, at home. My, again, my point is, is when Paul writes this second letter, it gets more passionate. He really writes from his heart about how he wants the church to strive for the perfection bar. Don't just settle for your old sinful ways. Don't settle in for excuses. Don't just do it because, oh, I got to do No. You are in full-time ministry. And if this is your home church, redeemed and restored, I want you to take it to heart. I want you to be on fire. I want you to hate your sin. And I want you to love His Word. In this book, they will even challenge Paul that he wasn't even an apostle. How did, he, how did the church even come into existence then? Like, how come people in the church didn't go to bat and defend Paul and say, yo, kick that guy out. Whoever said that, poof, you want to talk that kind of nonsense? Get out of here. How did the church come even to pass? That's, a, that's to me, that's like saying Eliana, who you guys know that's the name of my daughter. That's like someone saying that Jim isn't your dad. Are you, Really? Those of you who have kids, imagine that. 
That's not your daughter. That's not your son. But the church permitted it. And Paul has to write a full-on rebuke to the church. It's not fun for him. Corinth is the church that gets corrected the most. We learned it from the first book. We're going to see more of it in the second book. But my final statement about that is just this. Do we hold one another in this family, in this fellowship, accountable for the things that you say and the things that you do? Is there sin going on in your life that no one knows about? You don't want anyone to know about. We're going to address that in our last point again. But man, Christ is coming soon. Don't you want to be found doing the right things? Working for the Lord? Serving Christ? Living for Christ? Does that concern you? Is that a burden on your heart? In this book, Paul's going to write and use ten basic different words for the word suffering. Five are found in this letter. And so when you read the words, he'll change the words so it could be suffering, tribulation, whatever. It's going to be the same word. But the reason I've called and the introduction to this book Continuous Comfort is because I have four points for you. So let's just read through verses 1 through 11. And then we'll back up and take a look. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so are Comfort, consolation, also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings for which we also suffer. Or, if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us from whom we trust that we will that he will still deliver us you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks be, may be made and may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many so as paul opens up the first point verses 1 through 3 if you're a note taker continuous comfort i look to my past I know some of you be scratching your heads. I look to my past. Well, what do you mean, Jim? Well, look again in verses 1 through 3. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies of God and all comfort. I know Paul probably had to remind himself before writing another correction letter. Oh, the kids don't get it. How many of you have children and they get it on the first time? Clean up your room. That's all you got to say. 
Hey, put that down. Put what down? <laughs> hey, no cookies at, before bedtime. How many of us learn our mistakes on the first time? Maybe if your head is split open and you're bleeding out for dear life, maybe you'll learn not to do that again. But if you're anything like me, it's an average of about seven times. <laughs> Until God says, are you done making that same mistake? If you were Paul, and you're ready to address this church once again, would you call them saints? I'd be tempted to write, you sinners! What's wrong with you? How dumb can you be? How stupid? How unchristian like? Don't you call Jesus your Lord? Look at what you're doing. No, there's none of that. When he writes and he starts off, first off, Paul, an apostle to Jesus Christ, notice, by the will of God, he remembers and is comforted by his own past because he used to kill the church. The will of Paul used to be Saul was that I used to kill Christians. That was my M.O. I hated Christians. I hated Jesus with an absolute passion. He calls them saints in verse 2. Again, that doesn't mean like that they did miracles and they had, you know, angel wings and things like that. No. They're just saved. Born again believers. And it says grace to you and peace. I love Paul. Here he comes. Hey man, I know you said I wasn't even an apostle, but grace to you. Do you see that, folks? Paul throws the heaping coals over their head by coming to them in a loving, man, none of us deserve this grace. None of us deserve this mercy. None of us deserve the peace that we get from being saved. No one, none, zero. And isn't that true for you and me? When a Christian sins against us, offends us, bothers us, it's easy to forget. And that's why I want to remind you in Lamentations chapter 3 in verse 21, the writer says, This I recall to my mind, and therefore I hope, I have hope, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations chapter 3, 21 through 23. Folks, aren't we gladly reminded that God doesn't just strike us dead at a certain point in our life because we struggle to get it right? We struggle to give the grace. We struggle to be merciful to one another. Great is His faithfulness, His compassions and His mercy. So He opens up to the church and says, Hey, I love you gentlemen. I love you ladies. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of us, especially me, need that reminder. Because we can be in leadership. I'm the elder. I rebuke. I'm the pastor. I'm here to correct. And there is a time and a place, and it is warranted, but it better come from an understanding, a place of absolute grace and mercy and love. Unconditional love. So Paul is reminding the church, but I think it's just a personal reminder himself that Listen, the church, he feels like, no doubt, it's falling apart. It's going to be lost to false teachers. It's going to be lost because sinners can't get it right. No, the Lord is in control. 
And I know Paul was comforted by that. That's why he's the good shepherd. I'm just this little shepherd. Because I have the same concerns. I know of marriages in distress. I know of single persons in sin. And some days, I'm like, Lord, I'm trying, I'm trying. I love them, I care for them, I correct them. God's like, I got this. Just let me deal with them. Give me some time, Jim. Were you made where you are to be overnight? Let me tell you, there's no microwave Christian. (laughs) I wish there was a formula for it, right? Throw us in God's oven. Bing! Right? I'm holy, I'm right. Marriage is great. Everything's good. No, I'm comforted by the fact that God's grace doesn't ever run out. And that His mercy is new. So when I wake up after having gotten in a big fight with my wife, that God still loves me. And thankfully, she still does too. So the first is, remember your salvation. Remember who you were before you decided to take Jesus seriously. Some of us just, I think, need that just friendly reminder sometimes to say, I'm not being so nice and kind to my fellow sisters. I'm kind of crabby. I'm kind of getting into you know people's mess. I'm causing problems. I'm just not really being who I want to be. Remember the comfort that is brought to your past. Now, speaking of the word comfort, because as we move in verses 4 through 11, you're going to see the word comfort come up 10 times, and it's the reason I've chosen it for the message. The word comfort does not mean, let's start there, it does not mean that God just wants you to just take it easy. Get that massage chair. You guys ever see those chairs that it's rubbing your back, you know. Feet up. Vanilla Coke, Eagles game. Yeah. It's not that kind of comfort. The Bible never says one time that God wants you to be comfortable. Do you understand that? He doesn't want you to be comfortable. The word in the Greek, parakaleo, comes from two Greek words. Para, from, besides, or near, it's a preposition. Kaleo means to call. To call out thy name. To call aloud. It's a really powerful word. Because in light of where we're going... All the trials, all the temptations, all the sufferings. God says He calls us by name and then He calls us to Himself. That's why you receive the comfort. That's how you receive the mercy and grace and the strength to go on another day. He sees where you're at. He knows what you're going through. And he says, RJ, he says, Daryl, he says, Jenna, come here. Come here. Come to me. Because I want to talk to you through this. I love you. Now let's talk about why this is happening. Remember when you were a kid? And maybe, I mean, this was just true for me. It may not be true for everyone. But I remember when I was really upset about something, when I would hear my mom say, Jim, come here. And I'd run up and cry and give her a hug. And she'd be like, what's wrong? What's the matter? That brought me comfort because she called me to herself and said, Jim, I'm going to help. I want to be there for you. Because I care for you. Are you getting the picture now? Because in this life, 
It's been best said. <laughs> you're either in a trial, you're coming out of a trial, or you're going into a trial. There's no time for just the Caribbean Christian. I've been searching for that destination for almost 20 years. And the longer I'm a Christian, the more I find the desert. The wilderness. The hardness. What's the old... You don't go looking for trouble. I don't need to. It seems to find me. Right? So when we talk about comfort, that's why we started with our past. When God called you out of your sin, called you to Himself and said, look at me. I love you. Will you confess your sin to me so I can come into your life and give you eternity? Give you hope. Give you love that you've never known before. To give you purpose and understanding for your life. That's where it starts. Now, as we move through 4 through 7, where are you going to find comfort? It's point number 2. It's you'll look to everyone else. Let's read 4 through 7 again. Who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation which is effective for enduring the same sufferings for which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will be partakers of the consolation. So Paul says something very powerful twice. In verse 4 and in, well, pretty much through the rest of the chapter. But he says this. The reason you're going through something uncomfortable, ready? Is because you can look around the room. Look at each other. The reason you're going through something hard right now is because of the person sitting to your right, left, front, center, back, every angle. It's for everyone else. What is typically the first behavior that happens when something really bad happens to you is all eyes go to you. This happened to me. Can you? I'm going through this. I'm dealing with that. I'm hurting because of this. I just went through that. Right? It becomes about you. And I know I'm only speaking from my flesh. If you think of others when something really bad hits the fan, you got me beat. Because I whine like a mule. It could be a flat tire. Why me, God? How many tires are working, but mine goes flat? How come my baby just won't go to bed? How come my boss? How come? How come? Right? And God says, listen, um... <laughs> I want to help the church. So you know what I'm going to do by helping the church? I'm going to put you in something difficult. You're going to go through something that isn't going to feel good, but it's going to have the most profound effect in eternity because you are soon going to be able to help that person over there and then that person over there and then that person over there. Question time. All eyes up here. When was the last time you went, so, you went through something hard and you shared it with another believer to help them? Or even an unbeliever? 
my wife and I had several miscarriages, or they call it, uh, it's like, you find chemical pregnancies. And the tears we shed and the pain that we suffered. God, why? Everyone loves to ask the big W-H-Y question. Why? And God's like, I, Jim, because someday you're going to help someone go through this. Then we found out Eliana had some deformities. Really, Lord? Are you serious, God? And God said, yes, I'm very serious. She's fearfully and wonderfully made. And the stuff you're going to go through is because I have people in the future that you're going to reach only because of this. No other way. The audience that you attract because of the trial that you're in, that's why it's there. That's how you find comfort. That God called you out to say, you're struggling to pay your bills. You're dependent on me. You're struggling with this. You're dependent on me. You're needed. You need this. You need me. It's so easy to read and it's so hard to remember. We can play Christianese all we want. Count it all joy, brethren, when you go through trials and tribulations. Ho, ho. You know how many times I've had someone say that? I'm like, you, you're about to know tribulation right now. No one wants that quoted to them when you first go into it. Right? But you will now when you realize that there's purpose because of the pain that's about to come. Whatever it is, that's how we can relate. So now someone who's lost a child to miscarriage, I can cry with them and say, I understand what you're going through. It hurts, I know. But sometimes it's the only way God can get you to look up instead of in. Because you look to yourself. And you think you have it all. And God shows us that we don't. Because He loves us so much. And He doesn't want you to perish. So if it means having a miscarriage, so you end up getting to heaven. Hallelujah. Some build their life on their careers. And then they experience a hurricane, and they lose everything, and it hurts. Yes, I guarantee it hurts. But if it gets them to finally look up, isn't it worth it? Suffering is the most mysterious thing in the Bible, and I don't have an answer to why, but I do know that the Bible says it's our fault because we brought sin into the world, Adam and Eve, and God pronounced a curse on this world, and now we live with sickness, pain, and death. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Because man and woman sinned. Only the Christian understands that, truthfully. So that when the horrible things happen, and the trials come, because it's mentioned 13 times in the next several verses of Enduring, trouble, tribulation, despairing, burden, 13 times in just these few verses. Paul is going to say to the church, listen, you're going to go through hard times. And every single time you do, you need to know where to find comfort and why and how you can be comforted. And I know when I went through some of my hard times recently when the baby was born, our church showed up at our door to help. And God said, God just said, see, Jim, look, 
I'm doing this so it actually uses the rest of the church. It brings them together. It unites us in love for a purpose so much higher than you can see. And I'm thankful now, I say now. But if you ask me the honest question, Jim, if you could go back in time and undo that, and have a child born without a cleft and palate, and have a child without an amniotic band, I'm not sure I could say I'd still choose it. Because I just want it to be easy. And I need you to know the Lord wants you to lead by example. So that when, verse 4, notice who comforts us in all, all our tribulations. There is never one time in your life on planet earth that God can't comfort you. Because every time you're hurting, He calls to you. He says, let's sit down. Let's talk. Vent to me. Talk to me. That we may be able to comfort those who, I like that, maybe. The maybe, I believe, is there because some of us, what happens when we hurt, we hide. When we hurt, man, we go ten feet underground, lock the door, store ourselves away, and just someday I'll wake up and it'll be better. doesn't work that way he designed us first off him and me God and me relationship he designed you and me for relationship and yes it helps when you can relate to the situation but it's not a requirement it's not if I'm going through something hard and someone just says hey Jim I know it's hard. Like Job's counselors, can I just sit with you? That's enough sometimes. Just to know that you care. Don't be afraid to share whatever tribulation, whatever trial, whatever it is you're going through. Because in this life, the generic word you know that's used can speak about things not just within Christianity, it can be sickness. It can be just trouble at work. It can be a rough marriage. It can be anything that troubles you. But when you get down to verses 5 and 6, for as the sufferings of Christ abound, so our comfort also abounds. And now if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings. These do revolve around suffering for Christ. So if you're a Christian, wherever you are, and you get picked on, you narrow-minded, unintelligent, hateful, because you don't endorse all kinds of sin, yeah. Who wants to sign up for that? Come to get saved and then endure the hardships. That'll empty the pews because some people are coming to church because pastors are deliberately trying to get them comfortable so that they can quickly get into your wallet. When was the last time you and I suffered at his expense? When was it? All eyes up here. When was the last time for being a Christian anyone said something negative to you? Because that's about the only kind of kickback in this world, in the United States that is, where you're going to maybe get some backlash for being a, a sold out Jesus freak. Meanwhile, the rest of our brothers and sisters halfway across the world are laying down their lives at record rate. I still wonder what would happen to the church in America 
if we began to die for our faith. When I see my own family show up as the lions were ready to eat me, as the gun was ready to go off, because they don't believe, I do. I wonder if they would show up at my execution. And would I be able to handle it? What kind of comfort, ladies and gentlemen, does it require for someone who's about to die for their faith? I read the story of one martyr who knew he was going to die the next day, burned on the stake to be lit as a torch. And just to try to prepare himself, he touched and put his hand into a candle and it burnt him bad. Because he was just trying to prepare for the next day when his whole body was about to be ravaged by flames. What would it do to your faith if you watched another brother or sister burn to death for Christ? It makes whatever I'm afflicted by look pretty Small in comparison. My greatest affliction is my teeth. Nine root canals. I know sweets. My mom said sugar stick. I can't help it. In fact, now my roommate holds me accountable because I eat Golden Grahams every single night before I go to bed. They're like, the Golden Grahams are out. It must be 10 (laughs) o'clock. And you know my m M&M? and I know, I'm wearing the wrong shirt, right? I can't help it. Well, I can, but I don't want to help it. But th- I, I have gum disease. I'm like, Lord, no one in my family has it. Why? Don't it, Jim, it serves a purpose. And for those of you who really want to know, I remember God used my teeth and gums as a chance to show me his providence. For those of you who don't know, I was a waiter down in Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, serving tables. That's how I paid through my way through school. I, w- I was going up the tables like this. Oh. Two girls, two ladies, I should say, probably in their late 20s, said, what's wrong with your mouth? I said, oh, I have a tooth that's, if you've ever had a, a nerve that's ready to go, you would rather, like, Somebody just rip it out with their bare hands then leave it in when the nerve is on the fritz. I said, I need a root canal, but I don't have the money to pay for it because it's $1,200 to get a root canal where I, where I went before. And I said, I'm out. I've maxed out my cards. I have no money. I, I have to somehow endure the pain. So I waited them. They were the last table of the night. I go back after they left. There was no tip left on the table. Really? (laughs) I won't tell you what the rest of my thought process was. I'm like, really? (laughs) What gives? Well, I put the salt stuff back, and when I moved things around, there was a check left under the table. And it was for $1,200. God, see, Jim, as much as it hurt, I used it to show you something really good about me, didn't I? That's why it's okay to suffer. It's bigger than us, family. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than you. And God works in such wondrous, mysterious ways that even tooth pain can lead to His glory. (laughs) So, look around. Who can you share your suffering story with to encourage them if they're in that same place? Who can you share with? In verses 8 through 10, we're going to look to the Word. So we had look to the past, my past, 
Look to everyone else. And now look to the Word. 8-10, through 10, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from a great, so great a death and does deliver us in whom we shall trust that he will still deliver us. Take note in verse eight. It could be one of the most heartfelt verses written by Paul. He says that so much trouble came to them in Asia. He was burdened. Circle that word for burden because it means to be depressed, weighed down, heavily weighed down, beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Circle the word for despaired. It means complete hopelessness. It means nothing can help. Completely out of options, out of resources. Imagine the Rocky of Christianity, Apostle Paul, says to you, there's no hope, we're all going to die. Wow, okay. What caused this? Many say it was his time spent in Ephesus when there was a huge riot. They wanted him dead. The Bible, as you move through 2 Corinthians, is going to talk about that he was threatened by his own countrymen. They wanted his head. They wanted him dead. How would you and I do if there was a literal death threat on your life for being a Christian? How would you spend the rest of your days? What would you do to find comfort? Paul says, listen... I was at a place, I was so burdened, so heavily weighed down by the circumstances that I was almost, you could say, almost suicidal. Do you know suicide is so high right now? The rate at which people are killing themselves. Sadly, look at the rate. Usually they end up, some of them, killing other people before they kill themselves. People are despairing. These people have no hope. And you and I have it. Do we share it? Do we talk about it? Or is just Jesus just church and I go there Sundays? Do you share this hope? The world is perishing quickly. It's unraveling fast. We need to share this hope, number one. But speaking of despair, I call it a drowning moment. Why? I asked you to turn there. Go to Matthew chapter 14. Please, you need to see this. Because every Christian and not alike can have these moments. In Matthew chapter 14, the famous passage where Jesus walks on the sea, and we pick it up in verse 28. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous and he was afraid, he began to sink and he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Probably the three most powerful words in this chapter. I'm dying. I'm sinking. I'm drowning. There's no hope. And it doesn't need a great teaching or interpretation. Simply put, when our eyes come off Christ and it goes on to our crisis, everybody drowns. The second you take your eyes off Jesus and you focus on a crisis, you end up in despair. The trial, the tribulation, what you're going through is designed by God, given 
to you by God, given to me by God, so that I can learn to stay focused. Because in light of what we just learned from the previous point, there's a great lesson. I need to be able to share that even when I want to quit, even when I'm suicidal, listen, you may have gone through something in your life that is absolutely horrendous. So terrible. You've been hurt. You've been burnt. You've been broken. And you just, Lord, in that moment, why? I just want to end it. I want to give up. I want to quit. I was raped. I was robbed. I was broken by this person. I was abused by this person. You don't think Christians go through this? You better believe they do. You don't think Christians kill themselves? Yes, they do. It's a serious moment. We need to stay always focused on Jesus because when the most despairing parts and those moments hit our life, the waves just block our vision. The enemy has a way of just saying things like, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care. Why would He allow this to happen? If He's a God of love, why would He? Meanwhile, it could be the enemy who's just been given permission to do these things. And He's the one that's lying to you. And so many people can fall prey to this, you know what? I'm done. This is too hard. I'm done. Hey, you want to be in full-time ministry? Be prepared. Because you're going to just wake up some mornings and Satan is going to just take his bat and he's going to just go to town. You all know Job. No one wants to study that book. Because no one wants to apply that. Do I really want to lose everything? Sit with boils? I've never had a boil. I don't think I want one. I remember the one time when I get nervous, I chew my fingers. My wife yells at me all the time for it. And one time it led to this really bad infection and it kind of blew up. It swelled up. It was full of nasty stuff. And just... You could blow on it and it hurt. But listen. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. And we all have those moments. His hand is never too far away. He's always there. But please. Please. If you're here today and you're listening and something so horrific has happened and you've despaired, you've been just kind of even a little distant from God ever since that happened. You, three words, Lord, save me. Get back into His arms. When things happen in our life and we don't know why, we fall, back, we fall back on what we do know. That the everlasting arms are underneath. He's always going to be there. That's why He calls you for comfort. Even in the moment. Hey, listen. There is a way. There is a biblical way to kill yourself. Die daily. The inward man. Kill him. Kill her. This is just flesh. This bruises, this cuts, this bleeds. But the real pain is on the inside. The internal man is what needs to be suicidal. He needs to die every day so that my spirit man can live. And when you're in the despairing, depressive, drowning moments, that's when you have to do it. 
Because the old man is ready to just say, I'm done, I quit, let's just end life. Let's just give up. Let's just go home. It's game over. How many in this room, especially at sporting events, have you shut the TV off? There's like 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute left. We're down whatever game of your choice. And you just, oh, game's over. Drew and I left one game. It was like that. I said, it's over. And then our boy, Jake Elliott, 61 yards, set a new record field goal. It's never over. It's always too soon to quit. It's always too soon to quit. You cannot just give up. Even if your marriage feels like, Jim, there's no hope. This ministry, there's no hope. My kids, I've given up on them because look how far away they are from the Lord. I tried. Look what happened. Look where they are. Look at my unsafe family. I quit. No. Don't. Save me, Lord. Bring me comfort in this time. Help me. And He will. Help me, Lord. Save me. Because what does He do? He delivers us. Look in verse 10. The first one, who delivered, that's past tense. From so great a death and does deliver... That's right now, present tense. And He will still deliver. That's future tense. Paul says, God has delivered me from past trials, even when they wanted to kill me. He's delivering me right now. They want to kill me. And He's going to deliver me in the future. There's never a moment when deliverance can't be yours. The way He chooses to deliver, however... That's up to God. Sometimes He delivers you from the trial. Sometimes He delivers you by getting you through the trial. Sometimes your head stays on. Paul's head is eventually going to come off. That's how he was delivered. Time to come home, Paul. But you've heard me say it before. Everyone can wear a red cape. Put a big C on it. Or JC for Jesus Christ. Because you are invincible. Until God says... Your days are done. So, don't give up. Continue to fight. Do you know what the kryptonite is to the Christian faith? It's doubt. Which leads to despair. Which leads to hopelessness. Which leads to just sorrow. No, there's hope for you. There's hope for your marriage. There's hope for your life. That's the good news. Last point, verse 11. I look to prayer. It just simply says this, that you also, helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Listen, Paul was not ashamed. Paul was not ashamed to say at least seven times, Guys, pray for me. Ladies, pray for me. This is Paul. He had to get prayer. He asked for prayer. How many of us regularly call someone and get prayer? How many regularly reach out to prayer when they're struggling? How many ask for prayer before they do anything? It's so important. Charles Spurgeon said you can't do anything but pray until you pray. Charles Spurgeon was prone to great ways of depression. If you guys don't know him, he was England's probably most powerful and famous preacher. He led thousands to the Lord. And he suffered from depression. He needed prayer. Paul needed prayer. Your pastor needs prayer. Most of, I have my faithful guys. I called some last night. One picked up, one didn't. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. He, but I'm always reaching out to prayer. I'm a donkey up here. Remember? It's donkey time. 
I need all kinds of help. I need strength. I need endurance. Because you need me to be strong so that I can hold you and help you and encourage you and be there for you. James, last point, chapter 5, verse 13. Is there anyone among you suffering? Verse 14, is there anyone among you sick? Verse 15. Is there anyone among you who has committed sins? Suffering, sickness, sinning. All through, every one of us falls into one of these categories, if not all of them. We all suffer, we all get sick, and we all sin. What do we do then? In 16, confess your trespasses to one another. Not so that we can just lord it over you or just become some micromanager of your life. No. So we can pray. Pray shows up in 13. Pray shows up in 14. Pray shows up in 16. Prayer shows up in 15. It's all littered throughout this chapter. But why? Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We need for comfort to call other brothers and sisters and say, pray for me. There is never anything too trivial to pray over. But there's always plenty of serious things to definitely pray over. Our phones are always on. You can always call out and reach if you need prayer. If you're here today and need prayer, do not leave without getting prayer. It changes you and me. Call out to God back in Corinthians as we close. If I could have the worship team come up. You also, having helping together, I love this in verse 11. Don't miss it. In verse 11, helping together is a Greek word. It's actually built three Greek words into one with, under, and work. And it's the picture of a laborer that's under burden that needs to get the job accomplished. What better picture for a church family that, hey, I call Daryl, hey, I call Eric, hey, I call whomever, and we labor together, we work together, I'm under some burden, and, jo- and God gets the job done. That's the way it was designed to be. So please, close your Bibles. The one thing I've loved so much about this church is it's family. And we care. We do. Would you please begin to, if you haven't already, open up sister to a sister. Brother to a brother. There is no need for shame. We're all sinners. We're all looking to the same Savior. But you can get hope and comfort in what you're going through. Stop suffering alone. Please, talk to someone after service. Come up and let us pray for you. And then let us call you during the week and say, how you doing? How can I help you? Come out to women's study and pour out your burdens. I don't care if you interrupt the ladies and their whole study is overtaken because you finally come out and pour your heart out. They will embrace you. They will love you as will the men. Bring a friend. Let them come and pour their hearts and souls out. Everyone needs to know that Jesus is where you find this hope and comfort in. And what better way than also through one another. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this word, your time. 
as we get ready to close, Lord, I just thank you for your goodness and your grace, your loving kindness that leads us to repentance. Thank you that you can fix anything, help everyone, do anything. You, Lord, are God Almighty. Thank you, Jesus, that you save us in and through the storms, that you strengthen us when we have nothing left so that we will, Lord, just lay at your feet and know that you are God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We need you. We want more of you. Lord, I pray for my hurting sisters and brothers that you would please help them, save them, deliver them, comfort them in whatever they're going through. Help them to reach their hand up to heaven and say, Lord, save me. Lord, I pray for the broken marriages that you would please not let them end up in divorce. That you would help them see that you're in the mess and the muck and the mire. Father, I pray for the Christians struggling with sexual sin. That you would deliver them. That they're stuck in that despair. There's no way out, but there is a way out. I pray for those who are stuck in depression. That you would deliver them. Show them that this family is here for them. They're not alone. We thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.